Hello, students. Welcome to uh, uh, Principles of Marketing. This is uh, Professor Ahern. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about uh, Chapter 8, Products, Services, and Brands, Building Customer Value. Uh, this is from uh, Principles of Marketing, Kotler, 18th edition. Uh, today's discussion, I think, is particularly interesting when we going to spend some time today actually differentiating and having a better understanding of the differences of of actually products versus services, and then actually the composition of what a product is made of, and a little bit about categorization of products themselves. So I hope you find this, uh, this information uh, valuable. I think it will be because it defines a lot of the elements by which marketing brings value to products as they're produced. So let's, uh, let's move on to talk a little bit about defining what we mean by a product. So a product is anything that can be offered in a market for attention, acquisition, use, or consumption that might satisfy your need or a want. So it's really an offering to the market itself. That's a very general statement about what, what it is and what can be marketed. We could be talking about a range of different things and we're gonna really be defining exactly what we mean by product and giving a lot of examples in a minute. But one of the things that we should also understand is that there's a service as well that can be marketed. So a service is a product that consists of activities, benefits, or satisfactions that is essentially intangible and does not result in the ownership of everything. Let's just for briefly, uh, we'll get into this in more detail, but for brief example, when we think of services, it could be, for example, um, a massage. That's a service. So it's an activity, you're receiving a benefit, uh, you get satisfied from it, and it's intangible, meaning you can't hold it or possess it. Uh, it's, uh, and it's also something that can't be duplicated exactly the same way again. So services are unique, uh, and, and they are marketed, and they're one of the elements that we will be talking about today, as well as a tangible product itself. So... When we think about products, we can also think about services and the way we would be marketing those services as well. So one of the things that we know when we think about products and services is that, uh, is that there's, there's been a heightened amount of competition in the marketplaces globally. There's a number of reasons why uh, competition has actually increased globally uh, in markets. Uh, the first of which is that uh, if we think about the United States and we go back to 20 years ago, much of the products that competed against each other in the United States 10, 20 years ago uh, originated in or were produced in the United States or produced internationally, brought in and then distributed in the United States. And one of the things that we actually find is that there are more companies globally distributing across borders worldwide than ever before. As such, the amount of competition has increased substantially. The barriers of entry to markets have also uh, reduced. And what does that mean? It means that uh, some time ago, the ability to produce product or mass produce product and the ability to distribute that product globally was, was very difficult in many cases. So producing a product, uh, let's say internationally, and then distributing it in the United States was very difficult. Now we have all kinds of platforms to distribute through. For example, Amazon. A small company can distribute through Amazon and distribute globally through Amazon using shipping services like FedEx that, to be able to distribute and manage the products globally for distribution. So if we think about the barriers to entry, those have also reduced. So uh, in this research that was done uh, to be able to understand how markets have become more competitive and products and services have evolved, uh, some researchers asked 47 different corporations, and that is 773 sales executives, some information about what they perceived about their, the way their customers thought about their products and services. Now, if we look at uh, three years ago, the average uh, person out there rated their product as somewhat on the unique side. Now, if we think of the green side of this as unique and the blue side as substitutable, um, in this range, we would love our products to be very unique from everything else out there in the marketplace. So three years ago, they were thought of as somewhat unique compared to others. 
If we look at now what they're rated, they're rated as, as right around the middle, a little less, more substitutable and less unique. And what they're expecting in three years from now is the uniqueness to even decrease more. Now, what does this mean? This means that the, that, that the window by which when you introduce a product into the marketplace or bring something into the market that's innovative, the window by which you have that shows that your product is different from everybody else's is small because others will be able to produce those products, use copycats or me too types of products that enter the market rapidly. So for example, if we have Apple that does an innovation with their new iPhone, it's not going to be long before one of the other iPhone manufacturers, if they see that innovation is valuable, to introduce that innovation into their phones. So the window by which we differentiate our products into the marketplace and the services in the marketplace has collapsed and the marketplaces have become heightened as far as the amount of competition in the markets. So as we think about this, our book actually talks a quite about a bit about this too. And it talks about how product services and experiences are becoming more commoditized. Commoditized is a term meaning that um, there's very little difference between them. A commodity product, if we think of a traditional commodity product, oil, for example, is a commodity. You pump oil in one place, you pump it in another place, it's, it's, it's essentially oil. We think about all these different uh, products, cotton, commodity, uh, farm products, commodity. So when we think about products themselves that we produce, like, for example, technology, we would not want that product to be a commodity product. However, as products are becoming more and more closer to commodity that is substitutable with other products, it becomes more challenging for companies. And co so companies are now creating and managing what we call customer experiences with their brands or with their companies. So what they're trying to do is build an experience around their product or brand, build an identity around that product or brand that makes it very different from everybody else's. So they're trying to, to add on things or augment that product that we're going to talk about that makes it unique or different, that makes people want to utilize that product. So something different besides the actual physical makeup of the product itself. So we're gonna get into that a little more and think about how marketing plays a role in this, uh, in this uh, augmentation. So when we think, about, uh, uh, we think about what is a product, it's anything that can be offered to a market for attention, acquisition, or consumption. Remember we talked about that, or satisfied in needs. So this includes like physical products that we, we sell like a pen uh, or a car. So physical products, it includes services. We talked about massage services. We, we talk about, um, for example, a, a real estate agent, that's a service. Um, we talk, we talk about a financial service advisor, somebody who advises you for the, uh, for the markets. We had Justin Bremer talk to us earlier about that position at, at, at Fidelity. So those are services. Uh, persons, we can market persons. Uh, so oftentimes we would, we would market, for example, politicians. We can, mar uh, we can market um, uh, celebrities. So we wanna be able to market them or bring attention to them. Uh, we can market places. Uh, so oftentimes we uh, have locations, like we'll often see uh, advertisements for Greece, for example, to go on vacations in Greece, or uh, uh, location, location advertisements as well, or location marketing. Uh, we, can, uh, we can market organizations, ideas, to be able to, to make an idea more interesting, or combinations of all the above. So these are, there's a wide array of things that we can apply marketing concepts to. In fact, one of the most common things now that we're seeing is the absolute use of marketing and marketing analytics and data in, in, in political advertising to target the unique individual in the marketplace to persuade them to try to vote or to vote for a particular candidate or party. So we, we see that the innovation or use of marketing strategies permeates the marketplace throughout and is used in a wide array of applications. So let's think about what we talk about when we think about a product itself. So, so most companies ask, what, what is the customer really buying? For example, people who buy a Harley Davidson aren't just buying a motorcycle, they're buying the Harley experience. They're buying the freedom, the independence, the power, 
uh, the authenticity of actually being on a Harley Davidson. So Harley Davidson has a very unique brand and a very unique product that they've built that isn't just a physical motorcycle. So if somebody else built a motorcycle that was just like a Harley Davidson, but it really wasn't a Harley, would they be getting the Harley Davidson experience? So the extent to which we have that experience is what we call the, the, the augmentation of that, uh, of that product itself. So if we think about the product itself, the Harley Davidson, it's gonna have a core value. That is, it's gonna be able to, to uh, drive you from point A to point B. Uh, you're gonna have some uh, features of that motorcycle. Uh, so you're gonna, uh, that particular Harley Davidson might uh, have a certain engine style. It may have a, uh, a, a type of seat handlebars structure to it. Uh, so the design itself will be specific. The way it's packaged when it's, uh, when it's being shipped or delivered to you uh, is unique. The perception of quality too. So the extent to which we use quality parts in the manufacturing of, the, of their product. And then the brand name Harley Davidson itself brings a tremendous amount of value to the marketplace and unique value. So these elements are what we often call the actual product itself. But then on top of that product, there's a number of things that we can do to be able to augment or change the experience that somebody has around the product or that Harley Davidson. So for example, there's a after sale service. So when we bring the, uh, the Harley in to be able to be serviced to a Harley shop, how do they treat us? How do they take care of us with our Harley Davidson? Do they use authentic parts? Do they, uh, do, do they do an excellent job with service? Think about when you brought your vehicle in to be serviced or you've worked uh, at a service agency how they work with you. We think about an augmentation as the warranty, for example. Um, how long will they warranty the parts and uh, service on the, uh, uh, on the Harley? So if it breaks down in the first year or second year, will they take care of it? Will they fix it? So many, uh, or many companies, for example, will use warranty to offset brand. I'll give you an example of this. Uh, when Hyundai, uh, the auto manufacturer entered uh, the uh, U.S. marketplace and they wanted to sell their cars, they didn't have a very strong image. In fact, uh, the, the manufacturer had a weak image and a low quality image. So what did they do? They said, you know what, we know that our quality is good of the Hyundai. Uh, we, in fact, we know the breakdown rates are going to be low and we produce a quality vehicle. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a very big warranty and augment our product very highly. So what they did is they put a 10-year bumper-to-bumper warranty on their vehicle saying, if your vehicle breaks down, anything happens to it in a 10-year period after you buy it with 100,000 miles, we will fix it from a bumper-to-bumper -bumper, anything on the vehicle. What, that, what does that do? It alleviates a lot of elements about quality concerns, about brand concerns, things like this. So the augmentation offsets the actual product. Product support, if I need any information, if I need help, can I get a support agent? Can I get somebody to take care of me? How it's de uh, delivered to me, um, the, the, the quality of the delivery process, uh, whether I can get credit on the vehicle, uh, financing, whether I say they offer uh, substantially discounted finance rates, uh, credit terms for people who can't normally buy the, the vehicle because they don't have as good credit. So these are things called augmented product. So we, ought, we have the core value of the product, we have the actual product itself, and then we have the augmentation of the product. All of this goes into it, and you think about how marketing works in this. So I, what I recommend that you do that might be very valuable is to, to just choose anything that you're interested in, something that you've bought recently, or a service that you, uh, you participated in recently, and think about how all of this fit in with that product that you purchased. Think about all the elements. What's the value? What is it about the features and the packaging? Uh, what kind of augmentation was related to that? To that? And think about all that, and, and think about how marketing played a role in it, okay? So one of the things I want to bring up is, is the idea of services because, you know, many of us will think of products, but we don't think of services as much. So let's get into services a little more because services is a very important concept that we'll talk more of in this class. 
But, but it's also something that we often don't think about when we think about the marketing of products itself. So there are a number of different industries or sectors where service services are performed and, and it's very important to market those services. So for the government, for example, we have courts, hospitals provide service, fire departments, schools, post offices. Those are all service providers that are part of our government entity. Then what you think about the DMV, that DMV is a service provider for the government, okay? The private or not-for-profit, we have churches, museums, colleges. Our university is a private, not-for-profit service provider. So what, what services does University of Houston provide? How do they provide those services? And then we can go to business organizations like airlines, hotels, consulting firms, uh, telecommunication companies, uh, real, estate, real estate firms. All of these kinds of things are services. So as you think about this, there's a number of different organizations that don't sell tangible products, but sell services and utilize or leverage marketing uh, in the sale of their products. So let's think of a little bit more about what makes something unique that's a service and how that uniqueness of that element of the service makes it different from the way it's marketed. One of the first things about a service is that a service is intangible. That means services can't be seen, tasted, felt, heard, or smelled before they're purchased. So, so unlike a product, it, it has an intangible element to it. The next is the nature of variability. I mentioned this a little bit before, which is the quality of the services depends on who's providing them. So I might go to the same restaurant twice that has a service element to it and have a different waiter or waitress and, and be able to get very different variability in my service. I may go for a massage and get two different massages at the same place. So this, you cannot separate the service from the service provider. Uh, the inseparability is very important like we talked about. So services can't be separated from their provider. So that's called inseparability. So we have intangibility, we have the, uh, the element of uh, variability, we have inseparability, and then lastly, perishability. Services cannot be stored for later sale or use. When you get a service, you experience or consume that service immediately, and then that service is gone. So these are the unique characteristics of a service. So if we think about them, they have very important aspects to which impact the way we market these and we bring them to the marketplace. So the next thing I want to talk about is, is, is this is an important classification because we'll, we'll reflect on this again in the class, but this talks about uh, the way in which we market products based on the type of product it is. So there are four types of consumer products in the marketplace and each of them, and let's reflect on how you would market differently each of these types of products. So first let's think of in the, in the, the corner of this, we call it convenience products. So these are products you buy frequently and immediately, they're low priced, they're available at lots of locations, and they tend to be like impulse goods, emergency goods. So, so let me give you a couple examples of these. This could be like candy, it could be fast foods, it could be a magazine that we buy, um, uh, or a, something we buy, a book we buy at the airport or something. So these, these are what we call convenience products things that we could pick up, get them immediately, be able to purchase them. So, so some of the things that we might think about on this is, is uh, availability. We want to have these things out there and available to as many places as possible for our customers to get them. Uh, oftentimes we see these in, uh, in uh, grocery stores right at the uh, cash register. So you can pick up the candy as you're walking out. So these are what we call convenience products. These are ones that are low priced, at many locations and we want to be able to access them quickly. Okay, let's move over to the right to shopping products. These are ones we buy less frequently, we gather product information, we make fewer purchase locations, um, uh, the uh, price and quality is a big deal uh, and suitability is a big deal. So when we think about this, uh, these are less frequent purchases. They're, they tend to be more expensive, pricey, um, they tend to be things that we do a lot of time on looking for. So this could be like cars, for example. 
Uh, you know, we don't buy cars very frequently, we, but we spend a lot of time shopping and looking for stuff. So a convenience product, somebody might make an impulse purchase. Whereas a shopping product, it's very rare that somebody walks into an auto dealership and says, I'll take that car today. Um, that's also true for appliances like refrigerators, uh, dishwashers, um, uh, washing machines. Could be for beds as well. Like uh, one of our companies that works with us at University of Houston often is Mattress Firm. So mattresses, that tends to be a shopping product. People go out, they look for mattresses, they try them out, um, they price them. So they're expensive. So those are examples of what we call shopping products. If we go down to the left corner, that's specialty products. These are ones that we might buy for special purchase efforts, uh, unique characteristics. There's, people tend to be very, uh, uh, very brand conscious or identity uh, driven uh, on these products. These, these are products that people pay a lot of attention to because they're, they're part of their image there's very few purchase locations. We think about this, let's think about some of the brands that fall into this, like Louis Vuitton, Chanel, a lot of these premium uh, uh, type of high-end uh, electronics products too. Uh, like if we're buying a high-end uh, electronics uh, uh, product for ourselves as well. Um, we're buying designer clothes, uh, medical devices. Uh, this is also a specialty product. We're looking to buy a medical device so a hearing aid, for example, or something. These are very special uh, purchases. We're looking into things very specifically on what we'd like, okay? We go down to the bottom right. These are what we call a unique element called unsought products. So these tend to be things that customers don't want and don't think about, but they often need them. They, it requires a lot of advertising. It requires a lot of selling effort to be able to sell them. If, can you think of something like this? You don't really think about it, but you probably need it. Um, and so the company really has to reach out there and sell to you. One of the classic ones, this is funeral services. Everybody is ultimately going to need a funeral service. But do they go out and shop for funeral services? No, that just doesn't happen at all. Uh, people don't do that. So, so companies have to, they tend to contact older individuals to get them to set up funeral services or funeral insurance to be able to take care of their, and then plan their, plan their funerals or plan their last, to be able to take that away from uh, their children or their grandchildren to worry about that. So that's an example of an unsought product. Life insurance is an unsought product. Most people don't want to think about life insurance, but of course they might need it to be able to take care of their spouse, their children, their family members, things like this. So, so these are examples of these kinds of unsought products. Uh, let's, let's, uh, let's look at how these unsought products are advertised. Um, I want to give an example of this because often this is, I find this a particularly fascinating one. So this is a, an award-winning commercial from New York Life uh, where they are, are, are trying to bring people in to think about getting life insurance. So this is a persuasion commercial on life insurance. So let's watch it, and then we'll talk a little bit more about unsought products. The ancient Greeks had four words for love. The first is philia. Philia is affection that grows from friendship. Next, there's storge, the kind you have for a grandparent or a brother. Let's go. Third, there's Eros, the uncontrollable urge to say, I love you. The fourth kind of love is different. It's the most admirable. It's called agape. Love as an action. This is good. It takes courage, sacrifice, strength. For 175 years, we've been helping people act on their love so they can look back or look ahead and say, we got it right. We did good. So let's think about that commercial, uh, how that's leveraged. So this is a New York Life commercial. It won an award because what did it do? It inspired people to think about planning and thinking about others, and which would transition to a thought of life insurance, caring for others, taking care of people uh, after their death, that kind of thing. So that, that's, that's part of 
part of an unsought need, driving people to make a decision in an unsought need. So we've actually covered quite a bit today about different types of products and services. I hope you find this information valuable. You read through your book on this as well. Uh, and uh, I look forward to, uh, to seeing you in the next lecture.